Noah is brand new in our church, and he's already the leader of our lights crew. So when you start a church, things can move pretty fast. He's actually my team leader. I am on the lights team, and I know nothing about lights. But Noah does, and so that's a really good thing. And so he's already serving in a big way, which is really, really awesome. we got many stories uh, that we've wanted to tell since we've launched the church. We're going to be telling one every week. And so that was really, really cool. But that helps us launch into our series every corner every corner. You know, we launched this church eight weeks ago with the heart to discover as a people and as a church, how do we not just believe in Jesus, but follow Jesus? Because we like to say that in this life, when you believe in Jesus privately, you will go to heaven. But when you follow Jesus publicly, heaven comes to you. And and so today we want to take that one step deeper because we really believe when heaven comes to you, when you follow Jesus publicly, it shouldn't just change, heal and affect and bless your life, but the people around you. Because we believe that what God does in you becomes more powerful when it comes out of you. That it should actually not just affect you, but again, the people around you should get in on it. The world around you should get in on it. You know, there's a lot of people in our church that want to change the world. But what if God is simply calling you to change your world? The life that you live, the people around you. And what if God has already placed people supernaturally, strategically, specifically all around your life that you already get to love, serve, and share Jesus with? with. And please understand today, I'm not just talking about the people that look like you, talk like you, or even believe what you believe. Or I've shared this before, but only 5% of people in our city go to church on Sunday. And now I just heard that 70% of people in San Diego don't want to go to church ever for any reason. And you know these people. Some of them live across the street from you. They work in the cubicle across from yours. Um, They're the barista that you see four times a day because some of y'all addicted to coffee. We'll pray for you later. But some of these people are close to you. They're in your family. They're a close friend, and they do not experience what you get to experience. They don't have a church family like you do. And so we're just saying today, what about these people? And this isn't a series that's that's all about favoring people that are far from God, but but almost. I mean, it's easy kind of to invite people that already know God to church and invite them. That's awesome. I'm not saying not to, but what about the people that are far from God? You see, we are a brand new church. And by the way, this is a really good time to jump in. As you see from this guy, he he got promoted four times in like four days. It was pretty great. (laughs) But it's a good time to jump in because we are still defining who we are and kind of reaching the community. And by the way, it's kind of funny, but I meet new people every week, first time guests. And some of you here today are first time guests and we love it. We're so glad that you are here. But people come to me and they say, wow, it's a new church, but there's already a bunch of people here. I don't really know anybody. I'm new. Well, we're all new. You know, it's like we're only eight weeks old. Everybody's new. It's a great time to jump in. And let me just, let me just say this. Some of you will come here and you'll come through here. Um, you, you Maybe you'll go to another church or you move to a different city. But some of you are going to be here for many, many years to come. And that's really exciting to me. And it's exciting because we're going to see God do some incredible things as if he hasn't already. But we will be able together to look back what, one year from now, five years from now, ten years from now, and we'll look back on all that God did. And we might say, hey, we didn't. Remember, remember when we were at Point Loma High School and we just had that one service? We didn't really know what we were doing, you know, but it was fun. God moved. And so that's going to be fun to do. But what I want to ask you is this. What do you think you'll be thinking about most as you look back? Will it be the crowd that's coming? Will it be the building that we have or, or that we get to build? Will it be the website that we get to design? I think all those things are great. I'm really excited for all of them, but I don't think we're going to be thinking about the most, any of those things. I think we'll be thinking about the people in church who are sitting right next to us that we brought, that are now experiencing that we were experiencing what we're experiencing. Maybe they were the person in your life, they, they were your neighbor, your friend, your, your mailman, whatever. Maybe they were going through hell, but God used you to bring them to church, and now they're experiencing what you're experiencing. And what if they got people sitting next to them that they brought? How fulfilling would that be? Listen, I believe that our church will grow through the years, seasons and years and, and time that we, we get to, to have. I think a lot of people, different people will get to come. But what if it's not just made up of people that already know God? What if it's the people in your life who don't know God yet or are not living close to him at all? What if we have been defining spiritual maturity this whole time the wrong way? What if spiritual maturity is not just how many Christians you hang out with and how many Christians you love, but how about how many non-Christians that you hang out with? How many non-Christians do you love? What if it's not so much defined by how many Christians you, you serve and have influence with, but it's the people far from God that you serve and have influence? I don't know. I just feel like it's about time that we as a people, we as the church, we actually take risk and start making new disciples. Can I get a good amen? Amen. amen. Hey, and with that, why don't we go ahead and jump into our Bible story for today. If you've got a Bible, you can go ahead and pull it out. We're going to be in Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5 is we're going to be today. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to throw it up on the screen for your convenience. But at this 
uh, time in, in the gospel story, the Bible says that Jesus took his friends and they went on a lake. And, and they're going to the other side of the lake. But while they were in the middle of the lake, the Bible says a massive windstorm came upon them. Simultaneously, while the, the boat is filling with water, the disciples are freaking out. The Bible says that Jesus takes a nap. It's kind of a funny time to take a nap, don't you think? But maybe you felt like that before, that you were in the storm of your life. And it's like, where's God, though? Is he asleep? I've never felt like that before, but that's how the disciples felt. And it's actually interesting. This storm is really big. It's actually the most detailed account of a massive windstorm in all the Bible. But don't you know, it's also the most detailed account of Jesus sleeping in all the Bible. I think Jesus is preaching a message without even talking that when you're in the storm of your life, um, you may be worried, but God's not. He's really not. And I think that's going to be important for where we go today in Mark chapter 5. What we find out is that Jesus is actually using the storm. He wants to find out where the disciples' faith is that. He wants to test them because the disciples want to be used by God. They want God to give them new opportunity and responsibility, but they need to be tested. Because until you've been tested, you can't be trusted. And some of you today, you might want an increase from God, again, a new opportunity, a responsibility from God. But, but again, you might trust God, but can God trust you? God wants to know if he can entrust you with more. And so it's really important that we find out that when they get to the other side, that they, they go through the middle of a storm, which is their biggest test. And then on the other side, they get to cast out a demon, which is their biggest testimony. How many people know that tests lead to testimonies? When you let God actually teach you a lesson. And I just think that's important for us to consider today. Because I want you to consider some of the relationships in your life with the people that are either far from God or far from you. Right? Because you don't like them or you can't forgive them or they're nothing like you. Consider what God wants to do in that relationship. Because God would love nothing more than to move there. Because if he moves there, brings healing there, performs a miracle there, it'll prove he's Lord more than any other situation in your life. And that's just food for thought. But they go, from, they go from the most detailed account of a windstorm in all the Bible to the most detailed account of Jesus sleeping in all the Bible to the most detailed account of them casting out a demon in all the Bible. That's quite a day. How many people know it's like, wow, that was a long one. But it's just another day in the life of Jesus. And so here's what the Bible says. This whole time I've just been buying time for you to find Mark 5. Did you find it? You had enough time? Okay, we're all there. It's on the screen. Here's what the Bible says in verse 1. It says, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. Verse 4, for he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Which is to say that we will encounter people in our life and in our corner. They're going to be going through issues that you do not have the strength to overcome. I don't know if you ever experienced that. You, you don't really know what to say. You don't have the words to say. You don't have the means to really help them. Which just reminds us again, you do need to bring them to Jesus because he is your, their savior, not you. And so there will be people in our corner that we need to bring to the Lord. Verse 5, night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. Jesus heals the man. He heals him. And for time and focus, we're going to go ahead and skip ahead in the story to verse 18. Here's what it says. As Jesus was getting in the boat, he was leaving. As Jesus went to leave, the man who had been Demon possessed, begged to go with him. But look what it says. Jesus did not let him go. He said, ah, you're, not, you're actually not invited. That's kind of, that's what it seems like is going. You're not really invited. You should, um, you should go home. Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Verse 20, last verse. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Amen. Amen. Really excited to begin this series, Every Corner, with part number one. Today, I, I've titled it Invite Only. Invite Only. If you're taking notes, you're going to want to write that down. If you're not taking notes, whatever, you know, that's between you and God. But anyway, anybody in here, you, um, you, you, anybody, you, you ever not been invited to something you wanted to be invited to? Anybody? Come on, you, you not, not been invited. That you want to be, maybe it was a function some kind of event, maybe a wedding, maybe a hangout with friends, and you waited, you waited, you waited, but no invite ever came. 
You know, like maybe one day you're scrolling through your Facebook or your social media feed, you know, just heightening your fear of missing out. Maybe we'll do a FOMO message some other day. But you're just kind of innocently, mindlessly scrolling, and then all of a sudden something inside of you says, Stop! I saw something. And then you scroll back and you see this picture, and it's kind of a funny picture because it's a picture of all your friends, you know? <laughs> but what's weird about the picture is you're not in it. And that's weird to you because you're like, what, did I miss something? And so you go back because you think you're crazy and you check your text messages and you, you check your, um, your, your DM inbox. I don't have social media, so I don't know what it's called. But you check your social media and then you get real crazy. You check your email and even your mailbox as if your good friend sent you a letter in the mail um, to hang out, which probably didn't happen. But you're so confused as to why you weren't invited. But eventually you do realize I wasn't invited. And at first, you try to be really happy for your friends. You know, you're like, man, I'm so, ex- I'm so happy my friends get to hang out. I love them. I mean, shoot, they took such a good picture. You know, I mean, there's Tammy. I love Tammy. Oh, man, I'll never forget, you know, just a few months ago um, when I was there for her, when her boyfriend broke up with her. But I love Tammy. You know, I was just trying to be a good friend. And, and, and you know what? There's Lynn. I love Lynn. Um, oh, and you know what? I just remembered. I introduced Tammy and Lynn. Oh, man, I'm so glad that they've connected. You know, you're, you're trying to be happy. And on, on, the, on the outside, you're laughing. But on the inside, you're like, what the fudge brownie is going on here? How could they do this to me? You know, sushi's my favorite. How why would they do something like that? You're confused. And so what do you do? You text the nice person in the group, the one who's always trying to keep the peace. It's Tina. It's always Tina. So you text Tina. You're like, Tina, sushi, question mark, what's the deal? And uh, Tina texts back like, no, I, kn- I knew it. I knew you were going to feel left out. You know, I knew we should have invited you. like, Tina, who did it? Who did it? Who started the group text to go to sushi and purposely did not invite? Who did it, Tina? And she's like, you're going to be, no, who did it? You tell me right now. And she's like, ah, it was Ashley. You know, you knew it was Ashley. Ashley's been gunning for you ever since you made that comment about her new eyelash extensions. Okay, she's been after you. But here's what happens. You see Ashley the next week at church from across the way, and, like, your mouth starts twitching. You know, you're, like, really mad, and you say, man, I'm going to get Ashley. So you walk right up to Ashley, and you're like, hey, Ash, I was just praying for you. Um, What are you up to today? (laughs) And she's like, oh, I don't know. What about you? And you're like, I don't know, but I have this random craving for sushi. Have you had that lately? You know, like, you're so mad. You're so mad, and we get mad because why? We don't like to be excluded. We, we don't like to not be invited to things we want to be invited to. Have you ever noticed that when it comes to our own social circle, we feel a sense of ownership? This thing's my thing. These are my people. Do not try and keep me out. In fact, sociologists will tell us that our biggest fear as human beings is to be excluded, is to not belong. And so whenever someone tries to do that, they are now the enemy. Do not try and keep me out. And yet what's funny about that, I think a lot of times as church-going Christian people, is that we do this to people all the time. We, We hold people out of church all the time who don't look like us, who don't live like us, and certainly don't believe what we believe. And I'm not saying that anybody stands at the door and stiff arms people out. No, nobody does that. But subconsciously what we do is this. We look at people's way of living. We look at their unbelief. We, we look at, the, again, the sin in their life, and we see it as an obstacle. If they would just change, you know, if they would stop doing this, if they would fix this, man, then I would invite them to church. But you know what the problem with that is, is that Jesus sees people's sin, he sees their unbelief, and he doesn't see an obstacle, he actually sees an opportunity. Because what our religion, religious nature pushes us away from, Jesus pulls us towards. We don't run towards people like Jesus does. Now, it's really interesting that when you read the gospel, what you find out is that Jesus doesn't go from town to town to town to hang out with people he was already friends with. He doesn't come searching for people who already know him and love him. He's searching for new people. And I really believe that Jesus loves us, but he could have just loved us from up in heaven. He didn't need to come down here for that, but he comes down because he sees people who are far from God. He says, I need to do something about it. I need to come down. These people don't know me. He, he didn't come to keep anybody out. He actually wants to pull everybody in, which is kind of funny when you look back at our story today because doesn't it seem like Jesus is trying to keep this dude out? I mean, this guy just got set free. I mean, imagine how hard it was. He had a really hard season being the demoniac. Imagine coming back from that socially. You know, like everywhere you go, people are like, aren't you the crazy dude that was living in the cave I read about on Next Door Neighbor? That was you, right? You're like, yeah, you ate my dog, don't talk to me. You know, it's like, he was that guy. Like, he felt that he didn't belong anymore. He was no longer a part of the community. And then he sees this opportunity, he sees Jesus, his new hero, and he wants nothing more than to go and roll with his new hero. But Jesus says, well, I don't know if that's a good idea, you know? 
I don't know if we should be seen together. You know, the whole demoniac thing? That's going to look bad. The, the Pharisees will have a field day on the Twitter. You know, like, I just, I don't think it's going to work. You know what you should do? You should go home. You should go home because this thing here is invite only. That's what it seems like Jesus is doing, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you today, that's actually the opposite of what Jesus was actually doing. Jesus is looking at the guy, and he's not saying you're not invited, but what he's saying is you're not the only one invited. You see, contrary to popular belief, this whole God thing, this family of God, it's actually the most inclusive group of people on the face of the earth. The, the only thing exclusive about the family of God is that the Bible says there's one name by which men are saved, and that name is Jesus Christ. Friends, other than that, there is nobody too far gone, too broken, too hopeless in our life. Jesus wants them all. And if you're here today and you're far from God, he's saying, hey, I'm here, I'm willing, and I'm open. I'm not trying to keep you out. I actually want to keep you in. He, he's looking at this guy, and he's saying, hey, listen, it's not that you're not invited. You're just not the only one invited. You see, Jesus wanted him at the party, but he wanted him with a plus one. He didn't want him walking in alone. He wanted somebody on his arm. He wanted him to come with other people. And this is how we get. This is what Jesus wants from us. You see, one day when we get to heaven, it's going to be a big party. The Bible says it'll be a bigger bash than anything the world has ever seen. For those of us who have chosen to believe and follow Jesus, the Bible also indicates that one day there will be rewards in heaven. But how many people know the biggest reward you could have in heaven is looking across at the people that you brought with you, that you didn't walk in alone? That you had somebody on your arm, that you had a plus one to this party. Because listen, everything else in your life is going to fade away. And some of us really, you know that. My house, my career title, my bank account, my following on social media, right? My complete collection of all eight seasons of Magnum P.I. It's going to fade away. My body is going to fade away. I'm not going to have any of it one day except for one thing that I get to actually take with me to heaven. It's other people. And wouldn't it be really great? To bring with you people that you know right now, November 4th, 2018, they're far from God. You're not sure if they're going to be there with you even though you love them. You know, your people, your kind, and that's what Jesus is saying here in Mark 5, 19, right? It's actually written on your corner card. Did everyone get one of these when you walked in? Cool, four of you got one. That's good. Well, the rest of you can get one on your way. But this is what it says on your corner card, Mark 5, 19. It says, go home to your own people and basically tell them what Jesus has done for you. Okay, so there's two, there's two parts here in this verse that I kind of want to talk about. He says, go home, tell them what Jesus did for you. So the first part is go home. Okay, we don't usually do this around here too much, but the original language that the New Testament was written in is Greek. And the word here, and, and it's just helpful sometimes to go back and look. There's many more Greek words than we have in our English language, so sometimes we go back and look and kind of gives us some deeper meaning. Our English translation is very good, though, so that one you're reading is, is good. But sometimes we go back and we study the Greek. The Greek word here for the word home is this word oikos. Some of y'all have heard of the, the Greek yogurt online. It's kind of like that. The, it's that. It's O-I-K-O-S, oikos. And here's what it means. The Bible uses it several times, not for yogurt, but it uses it several times for house, household, and neighborhood. And you see the context with which it's being used here. This guy, it says he goes back and he tells his whole city, the Decapolis, meaning it's being used here as the people all around your life. It's people that you come in regular contact with. It might be your next door neighbor, the business across from yours, the guy in your office, your mailman, your hairdresser, for some of y'all to get a haircut every week. I mean, it's like people that you come in contact with. It's your sphere of influence. And we believe for most people it's eight to 15 people. Some of us might be more, some of us might be less, but even now you can think about who these people are in your life. And by the way, you can start writing them down. If you feel like God's put some names on your heart as the Lord leads, you can write them down. But I think sometimes we think about these people. We think about sharing the gospel with them. We think about inviting them to church, and it's scary. You ever thought that? Like, what would I even say? You know, like, what if they responded? What if they asked me a question? But look at the second part of the verse. It says, just share what Jesus has done in your life. How easy is that? It's easy, right? When it's relevant, share what this Jesus journey has done for you, right? In a similar way that when you've had the best California burrito in your life, what do you do? You tell 17 people about it. You definitely put it on Instagram. For those who do that, I mean, you do. So in the same way, you just tell people like that. Why? Because it's very hard to argue with somebody's experience. Let me tell you why I follow Jesus today. It's not because somebody talked me into it. It's not because somebody convinced me that the Bible was more accurate than evolution. And all those things are true, and they enhance what I believe, and they give me more foundation. But the reason that I follow Jesus is because a long time ago, I was going to say how many years ago, but that's scary to me, so I won't say it. Years ago, I had an experience with God 
And nobody can take that away from me. It was the realest experience I've ever had in my life. I was wondering, did, do I matter? Do I have purpose? And in one moment, God filled me from head to toe, and nobody could talk me out of that. It's an experience that I've had with God. People can't argue with your experience. They also can't argue with your joy. People can't argue with joy. You know, C.S. Lewis said it's our, it's our duty as a Christian to have joy. So when people look at you and they say, yo, there's something different about you, what is it? I need to know what it is. Right? That's how you know your life is relevant to the people around you. They look at you and they want what you have. And I'm not talking about your house or your spouse or your stuff. But they're like, the, and most people call, have you heard that? Energy. I want your energy. Everywhere I go, people are like, you have a good energy. And it might be energy, but that, it's joy. It comes from the Lord. It's the spirit that's inside of you. I remember when I was in college, um, this is not everyone's experience, but when I was in college, I was a waiter. I worked at restaurants for four or five years. And, and again, not everyone's experience, not trying to create a stereotype, but when I was working at restaurants, most people that I worked with partied really hard, did a lot of drugs, slept around, drank a lot because it was a very high stress job. And so people were just trying to get, you know, an out any way that they could. And so that was kind of a normal thing. But there was this one guy that, that worked at the place that I worked at and he came in and he was full of life. He had a lot of energy and he loved people really well. He was good at his job and people would go to him and say, hey man, what is it about you, you know? Like, tell me, what parties do you go to? I need to go to those. What drugs do you take? I need to take them. And he would tell them every time, yes, you do need to take the drugs that I'm taking. Come take the one drug that has no come down. It's called the Holy Spirit. Why don't you come to church and actually meet Jesus? It'll change your life. And people would. And they would because they couldn't argue with his joy. It was like the one commodity that everybody wanted. And how many know Jesus is the only dealer in true joy? The difference today between joy and happiness, it's not really my message, but we're here, so I'll just go there. You know, happiness, <laughs> happiness is very circumstantial, but how many know joy is eternal? I got, I got joy in something that will not change, and so my situation says no good, my God says good, I'm good. I'm good. That's joy. People have a hard time arguing with that because they see it all over you. Just tell people what he's done for you. Is it really that simple? Yeah, and let's just admit, today, this is the most simple message I've ever preached, I think, in my life. Usually we get deep into, no, I just, on purpose today, it, it's simple because I want you to see how simple it is to serve God, to be involved in ministry, to see God move through you, okay? Not, not that it's always going to be easy. How many know sometimes in church we make following God really complicated but too easy? It's actually really simple, but it's sometimes going to be hard really hard. You know, I really believe that my job as a preacher is not to teach, only to teach you things you've never heard before. Sometimes you'll get new revelation and you'll see things in the Bible you've never seen. You hear statistics, whatever. But I think a lot of what my job is, is not to do is it's not to teach you things you don't know, but it's inspiring you to do things you already know. How many know that sometimes you hear something true, you're like, mm, that was good. It's not that you didn't know it. It's just you don't do it. We already know this stuff. We just need to be inspired to do it. And, and so sometimes we make this thing really, really complicated. What's God calling me to do? Do I need to quit my job? No. Maybe some of you. Okay, but like 95% of you know. No, no, no. In fact, are there hurting people at your job? Are there people who need hope? Are there people far from God? Then don't leave. God probably wants you right there. And so we've made it really simple for you today. So if you've got a corner card, you can, again, pull it out if you haven't done it. Already there's five steps, and each one of these is its own sermon. But Today, as we launch the series, I kind of wanted to explain each one. So we're going to touch on each one of these um, as we go through. But the first one says list. List. Make a list. And here's what it says. The 8 to 15 people, list 8 to 15 people with whom you have developed relational equity. Okay, and here's why that's really important. Here's why I want you to make a list. Because this is what I believe. It's important. I believe that God has given you eyes for people that he has not given eyes to anyone else in this church for. He's given you eyes for people that nobody else in this church has eyes for. Why? And here's what I mean. I've been doing ministry for some years, and I hear this all the time. I can't do ministry. That's your job. That's the job of the pastor. Okay, and here's the problem with that, though. I don't know your cousin. I don't know your neighbor. I'll probably never go to your family gathering. I hate to say it, but I'll probably never visit your classroom whether you're a teacher or a student. I'm not going to go, I won't, we won't, but you will because God's already placed you there. You're already there. And what if you're already there for a reason? What if God has you there for a specific work? And, and let me say this. Even if you really, really don't like where you're at, 
Even if you hate your job or you hate your class or whatever you're in, even if you hate it, let me tell you, God has you there for a reason. Number one, you could ask yourself, what's God teaching you? This is a totally different message. Okay, but the season that you're currently in is always preparation and a prerequisite for where you're going if you let God teach you the lesson. You ever felt like 10 seasons in a row? It's like, I'm learning the same lesson. That's weird. That's because you haven't learned it yet. And unlike, and, and unlike, unlike God, God's not in a hurry. We're in a hurry. God's got all the time in the world. Amen? I mean, like, that's just a fact. He's got nowhere else he'd rather be. He'll take his time to teach you the lesson. That's up to you. So that's a different message. But, but number two, consider who's around you and why they're around you for such a time as this, whether you like your situation or not. And I shared this little story in one of our preview services, but there was a church several years ago that I came to. I was brand new. And I walked up, and I wanted to get involved right away. And I said, hey, I said, where do you need uh, me to serve the most? And I said that because I knew that was the right thing to say, even though that's not really what I meant. Okay? It, it, deep inside my heart, that was not really what I meant. In fact, here's what I thought. This is an evil thought. It's terrible. Uh, this is what I thought. Just don't make me a door greeter. That's what I thought, which is funny because today, the people that know me, that, that's my dream job. Okay, if I didn't do this, I would be standing at the door because I love meeting new people. By the way, my name's Wes. If I haven't met you, I'd love to meet you. But anyway, um, that's like my dream job. But back then, I had a, a false view of what was important. I just wanted to be up in front. And I was just coming from a church where I knew everybody. And I was up in front, so I just thought, oh, don't, don't do that to me. And so sure enough, but I said, because I knew it was the right thing to say, um, I'll, anywhere you need, I'll, I'll do that. And they're like, well, we need more door greeters. I was like, no. You know, so I went to the door. But here's, here's what happened. So it's while I was greeting at the door that I met my wife, Monica. Come on, by grace you have been saved, not by works. I did not deserve that one, if we're being honest. Like, that was not my doing. What's my point? My point is, if you're single, be a door greeter. Like, that's... <laughs> That's my point, man. Like, like when she walked in, I said, who was that? Okay, like, have mercy on me. It was like, because I was greeting at the door. No, but my real point, my real point is this. My real point is this. You might not be exactly where you want to be, but you might be around exactly who God wants you to be around. Who are the people around you in this season, in this moment? So here's what I would encourage you to do. Slow down, pick your head up, and look around. Because you might be chasing something that's going to fade while missing people around you that won't fade. And you'll regret it later. So make a list. Okay? Is that cool? Number two. Number two says pray. Pray. And here's what it says. Pray daily for these people that they would sense God's presence in their life and be open to his love. And here's a prayer I've been praying lately. I've been saying, God, give me your tears. Just something God's been been putting on my heart. And this may or may not be the message I preach next week. I already had a message for next week. Now i got two messages for next week? Can we have a three-hour service next week? Is that okay? Just kidding. I promise I'll pray and bring one. But, but God, give me your tears. And I've been praying this because I really think that God has tears for the people around. How many know that sometimes tears is a sign of weakness? But sometimes it's a, it's a sign of strength because it's passion that's coming out of you. I believe God has tears for the people around our life that are far from God. And so sometimes I say, God, give me your tears because I don't want to be drowned in our culture of convenience and comfort and ease, because that will drive me to do nothing for you, nothing at all. And so God, give me your tears, because how many people know that, that true prayer does not cause you to sit down on the couch and do nothing? It causes you to get up and do something about it. L listen, real prayer is not you sitting on the couch and praying that God will give you a job. Okay, true, real prayer it is not going to be God, you know, I pray that you bring my friend to church and never inviting them. Real prayer is not, God, send me a spouse, but never even going up and saying hi to her. Come on, dude, like trying to help a guy out in here. It's like, it's not saying, God, would you speak to me, but never making time to listen to him. True prayer is actually making time to spend with God. It's making time to have action. It's not hoping that your family would be open to Jesus, but never making space to invest in them. And so that's number three, and that's how I'm going to trans transition out. Number three is invest. Invest. Prayer will make you do something. Here's what you should do. Invest. It says, watch for creative ways to bless and be generous towards your people. And can I just say this? Will you please do this? Please? And here's why I say please. Because I think when we don't do this, but then we invite people to church, I think that we are solidifying the stereotype that God doesn't want something for you. He wants something from you. It makes people feel like they're a project. But when you invite before you invest, it feels ingenuine. There's a guy in our office space, we, we have an office at Liberty Station, and there's a guy, I don't work with him, but I work around him, and he's in there, and this dude, I, I've probably talked to him 25 times, 
between, we've had two minute conversations and we've had a couple 45 minute conversations just I I as we're down there in, in the office space. And this dude's far from God. He's pretty obstinate towards God. He's not interested I at all. And I'm pretty sure he doesn't know what I do. Um, yeah, except the other day I was, he was sitting there and I sat next to the booth next to him and I started talking to him and uh, he just had like a big investor he was trying to get. And I'm like, how's that going? And, and this lady walked by who also says herself, I'm far from God, don't talk to me. And she's kind of warming up to us now. So she walked by, she's like, hey, how's the church going? So he may now know what I'm doing. But, but before that, he didn't, he didn't know. And, and this might surprise you. I've talked to him many times, but I haven't invited him here yet. He's on my card. He's number 21. I know we're only supposed to have 15, but you caught me. I have, I have a little more. <laughs> I haven't invited him yet. Why? Because I know that my invite it is like a silver bullet, and I'm holding on to it. Because this place is so valuable to me, and I want him here so bad. But here's what I, I need him to know that I love him first. I need, listen, this is what Jesus models all throughout the gospel. You notice that Jesus never invited anyone into anything without investing in them first. He, he goes to their house. He reclines at their table. He shares a meal. He heals them. And then he says, go sin no more. Come follow me. Whatever else he said. I mean, he did that first. He invested in people first. It was important to him. You ever notice that when you invite people to church, they get angry? They're like mad. Why? Because they feel like a project. They feel that what they've always thought is definitely true, that these people want something from me. They want something from me. And so for the people around you that you know are around you, invest in them first. Now, this is a little bit different than a few weeks ago. The week before we launched, I was on a plane um, heading home from Tampa. And I sat next to a lady, who, again, who didn't know the Lord. And so I shared the gospel with her. Um, and and, and she, it was funny, for the first 30 minutes, she didn't know who I was. It was funny because she was dropping like an F-bomb every like third word. And then she found out what I did. She was like, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, it's okay. Be you. You know, I'm just trying to help people be them. But, but she asked me at the beginning, like, what are you here? I'm like, I'm visiting a friend, which was true. I was visiting a friend at a church that we were partnering with. <laughs> but, but I shared the gospel. I knew I was never going to see her again. But for the people around your life, they're all over the place. You're probably going to see them first. And so please do not invite someone you're not willing to invest in. Invest in them. But gosh darn it, invite them because they're not here forever, okay? And so that's what the fourth one is. It's invite. Invite them to church or your community gatherings regularly. Look at this. It takes seven times for someone to actually feel invited. Can you believe that? Seven. And some of us know that there's people in here, there's people in our life let me tell you, there's some people in your life that just need one. I, I believe that there's one person in all of your life that's waiting for an invite. It's just going to take one. I really believe that. But there's some people, and you know them, they're going to take 20 invites. Are we willing to do that? Probably not a lot of the time. But what if you were? And here's the other dilemma. Can you imagine? What if this? What if you were going to be the fifth invite on a list of seven? Meaning that you never saw the fruit in their life, but you helped cultivate and water the seed. And, and, and here's a story I have for that. When I was in college, I went to San Diego State, and I led a ministry on campus there, and I invited this guy in my class all the time to come, and he didn't come. And the semester ended. Many semesters go by. I see him at graduation. I'm like, hey, man, how you doing? I hadn't seen him in a while. And he's like, he's like, hey, I gave my life to Jesus. I'm involved in a church now. I'm like, dang it, I invited you. You know, like, <laughs> why don't you come to my church? And, no, I'm just kidding. I didn't say that on the outside. I said it on the inside. But anyway, he... Um, <laughs> But he looked at me and he said this, but I, I have to thank you, man. I know you invited me all those times. This is what we said, but I wasn't ready. I was mad at God because my parents had just separated, but you helped get me closer. And so here's what I'm saying. When people know you care about them, the invite's never wasted. Never. No matter what they do, they might spit you in the face, but you know you made them think about God. You know, when we started this church, we sent out a mailer, and some of you guys came because you got the mailer. That's awesome. But we sent out thousands of mailers. Was that wasted money for the people who didn't come? Are you kidding me? We at least made people think about God, and some of those people, they don't even know the last time they thought about God. It's awesome, and some of them aren't here yet, but when tragedy hits their life, when they want more, when they're ready to take another step, they'll be here and we'll celebrate. But what if they go to another church? Could we celebrate that? Absolutely. We're planting seeds. When people know you love them, your invite is never wasted. And here's the last one, and I'll end with this is lead. Lead. Become an example of Christ to them and, min and a minister of grace. And the word minister can seem kind of complicated and, and complex, but the word minister means to serve someone's needs, okay? 
So don't invite someone and stop serving them, but now show them what wholehearted living looks like. Now you can influence them. And by the way, that's a really hard thought to think about today. Is culture, are you as the church being influenced by culture or are you influencing culture? And here's what I mean. A lot of times, you know, we, we are on social media, we watch the news, we watch TV for four or five, six hours a day, and then we read the verse of the day for two minutes and we think it don't matter, like it's not going to affect us. It does. It absolutely does. So sometimes we start looking more like them than helping them look like the church, and now we're not leading them very well. Listen, Jesus was the master of going into a dark place and bringing light. He was the influencer. He was the leader. And why did he do that? He did that because he didn't want to keep anybody out. And here's the last thought that I'll leave you with. Isn't it interesting to know that there was somebody in your life who didn't want to keep you out? That you were on somebody's corner card, if you will, at one point in time. Somebody wanted to bring you to church and introduce you to Jesus. And for some of us, that was a parent, it was a coach, it was a friend, it was a neighbor. For me, it was my first youth leader. His name was Levi. I named my son after him. And he's not the only godly influence in my life, but he, he surely helped a lot. And I'll never forget um, that I went to this youth camp, and I gave my life to the Lord at 18 years old. It was my first youth camp. And after the camp, Levi came up to me, and here's what he said. He said, hey, man, I just want you to know that when I met you, I felt like God spoke to me. He had met me years before he came to one of my football games. He said, when I met you, God told me that, that I was going to pray for you. God gave me eyes for you, and so I started praying for you. And before I ever gave a rip about Jesus, this dude was praying for me, and then he started investing in me. He came to my football games. He picked me up from school. He bought me in and out which led me to Jesus after that. I don't know how you say no after that. He invested in me, and he's the one that invited me to that youth camp where I gave my life. To Jesus, again, he was not the only godly influence in my life, but he was a big one. He led me all the way to the feet of Jesus. And one day, we will be in heaven, and he will look at me, and he will smile because he will know that I am his reward. And everybody I bring with me is his reward, too, as he watches his fruit grow on my tree. So what I want to ask you is, who's your reward? Because I believe that there is coming a day, and I don't want to be in too intense, but I just believe it. There will be a day, one day, when all the things that you're building today, your house, your career, your social media following, you would trade it all just for one more chance to reach your mailman. I believe that. But you're not going to be able to. You're not going to be able to then, but here's good news. You can now by writing a name down on that card. Who is your reward? And I'll finish with this statistic. 95% of people who give their life to Jesus is because they were invited to church on Sunday by a friend. 95. 95. Meaning we'll send out the mailer, we'll do the billboard. That's awesome. But 19 out of 20 people that are going to come here and find Jesus, they're your friends. They're not going to come because I'm the best preacher in town. They're not going to come because we have the best building or the best worship or whatever. They're going to come because... They're going to see your joy, and you're going to bring them with you on your arm because you have a plus one because this thing ain't invite only. You're invited. You're just not the only one invited, and so who's your reward? And so here's how I want to finish. Why don't we go ahead and stand to our feet? We're going to go into one more worship song.